The year is 1997. A massive threat in the heavyweight division known as Ike Ibiabuchi is being seen with watchful eyes by avid boxing fans. This young monster is hyped up as being the successor of heavyweight legends Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield. After many destructive knockouts against lesser known boxers with only one going the distance, the undefeated machine is ready to prove himself to the public and put his name in the air for the world to remember. Ike's next opponent is the also undefeated David Tua, and he himself is expected to get his first title shot in the coming days after some marvelous recent performances. But now is time for the fight between the President and the Tuominator. Can the man at the top call in his special forces of violence, speed, and momentum, or will the machine dominate man, using a big red button of his own to bend, bruise, and break Ibiabuchi into self-destruction? Welcome back to Boxing After Dark. Today we're looking at a fight between two huge gladiators that until this point had few people talking about them as serious contenders. Tua had been the more successful fighter of the two up-and-coming stars, beating John Ruiz for only the third time in his career by a first-round knockout just shortly after his impressive energy-filled victory against David Izon. Ike had far less notable victories, fighting mainly journeymen and inexperienced amateurs, but had beat Anthony Wade in comfortable fashion. David Tua was a big step up for Ike, but he seemed more than ready to give the performance of a lifetime and win his first belt, the WBC International Heavyweight title. Whilst some had begun to compare Ike to the legend Mike Tyson due to his similarity in strength, definition, and ferociousness, it was hard to take the claims truly seriously due to his poor resume. But whilst the claims of him being one of the next big stars in heavyweight boxing was seemingly a huge reach, this man was admittedly at the beginning of his career, racking up wins and looking dominant all the while, which is always the first step to being a great as shown by many legends of the ring before him. Ike was a threatening fighter for his athletic and powerful physique, but what made him even scarier was his actions after his victories, often chanting religious rituals and making the spines tingle of even his greatest admirers. And whilst Ike was looking formidable and physically strong, his mental power was seemingly working overtime. And as we'll soon see, this fight would lead Ike Ibiabuchi to be the face of one of the most dark, gloomy, and sour stories for a boxer ever to be told in the history of the sport. Whilst both fighters had their pros and drawbacks, both were underestimated for what many perceived to be their weaknesses. Whilst Tua was regarded as slow and bullish due to his tough exterior yet lack of height, his throwing speed could be lightning fast when necessary, and he was never afraid to give 10 punches to land three. Ike, meanwhile, despite being riled up to be the second coming of Mike Tyson, was criticized for his lack of power in comparison, something that was still extremely solid considering the competition he'd faced and what he lacked in power. He more than made up for with his timing for counters and endurance when in a sticky situation. The fight arrived on the 7th of June in 1997 at Arsino Arena in Sacramento. The heat was palpable, but whether that was coming from sunny California or the tension between these two monstrous heavyweights was impossible to determine. The fighters touch gloves, and the bout begins. It was a year ago when he crushed John Ruiz in just 19 seconds. And he's coming off an 11th round TKO victory two months ago against Oleg Maskaev. Scorecard inside the Iceman, John Scully. Let's have a good jab and like you. There's that big sweeping right hand from David Tua. Up big... out of Dallas. Ivy Abuchi started out good with the jab to figure out in certain instances. And it's no secret that he should bring in going head to head. There's that left hook from David Tua. Ike unfazed. Well, it's his first appearance on the big stage for Ike Abeyabuchi, and it's a good showing right from the start. End of one. Round one was as explosive as could be expected when the fight has the most punches thrown in the history of a sport spanning centuries. Two men of this heavyweight division. Somebody, he, um, he has his constantly doing good right. and uh, start jab and then pump the right hand right behind. Extremely powerful puncher comes with the right hand again out of the way but this guy seems to be initiating a fight. Abeobuchi goes back to the left hook. How it begins it matters how it ends and it's beginning. Tua trying to rally at the end Abeobuchi meets him. What a strong start for the Nigerian native. Right after those opening six minutes where he set a very, very early pace. It's funny, Ronnie Shields started out by 
you know, how, you know, you want to keep motivation up. Like, is that he asked him, "How do you feel?" He is committed to it, but move just step now right in front of him. I don't think two is used to this. Right hand over the top from a Bayabuchi. That he seems to have a good selection of punches. He uppercuts. He hooks to the body. He's got the right hand. He throws him in there. Ibeabuchi with two left with a left right of his own. There's a short uppercut on the inside before Tua comes back with a left hook. Coming to the end of three, Tua and Ibeabuchi. Violence on the inside. Break a rib, he said. Ike Ibeabuchi, 16 and 0, 12 knockouts. By far the biggest fight of his young career for this 24-year-old Nigerian. Most recently, we will see. When Ibeabuchi has seven. And that's the... Meanwhile, you wouldn't think this is how he fights. Four rounds in the books. Perhaps the first round that you could even lean to his way. Oh, you heard Curtis Cox tell Ike Ibeabuchi, you're staying inside too long for me. Watch out for us. Two every, every 15 or 20 good shots, but you could pile up points like that. Win these rounds easily. You want to see him at two of them just impressive with that it's really one of the things that's so impressive about a guy that we haven't seen him before i never forgot he said there's guys out there you've never heard of can uncover a gem there's that left hook from Tua, his signature punch and he catches him again but ike stays right there with him he's not afraid Left hook of his own. Tua now opens up with a left hook, and Abiyabuchi returns fire. Good stuff between two undefeated heavyweight prospects. Double left. He's giving Tua things to think about. Double left hook by Tua closes out the fifth. Tua began to turn the tide by the end of round five and put on his best performance of the night so far, slamming Ike with punches that would put most other opponents on the floor and finished with the sport for good. And the subsequent right hands and double left hook, and here now a left hook in the six, are things starting to change. It's starting to feel a little bit more comfortable. There's a good right hand, but um, bombs from a guy like Tua is do. I think there's smarter ways for I Will the experience... Left hook, and then goes downstairs to the body with it. A, a professional fighter, but with really top-tier guys. Got a tremendous defense. It seems like he's getting into a little bit of any type of real respect for him. It's off a combination late. End of six. Almost demanding that at this point you have to hurt this guy. Meanwhile, Curtis Cox, at the halfway point of the scheduled 12 rounder, telling Ike Biabuchi, don't quit. Surprising comment? Really, how, how would he know? He's never done. So that's where the mental aspect of boxing comes into play in the corner. Tyson had those fast hands, and on the inside, he, he had blistering combinations that he let go to the body. Uh, so easy to make those comparisons to Tyson. Short run comparisons, but to it with this fight seems... There's that right hand. Steady work rate of Ike Abeyabuchi, end of seven. Two of the much more established heavyweight prospect at 27-0 with 23 knockouts and wins over named opponents. And you gotta make a strong run at him. So maybe, just maybe, they're worried about it potentially slipping away. I think back up, they'll just keep falling. Also, he might not realize how well he's doing. Abeyabuchi working Oh, good short right hand by Abeyabuchi. Doing well with it. Uppercut by Tua. Punches of David Tua in that sequence. Right lead, left hook by Tua. Tua there. Tua right hand to the body underneath. Just never a, a really... And with Ike Abeyabuchi and his commitment to count the double left hand. Just any reason to get off his... Being consistent. Physically imposing frame, 16 and 0, taking on the power punching David Tua. I been able to stay with this. Ike doesn't need to do this. He doesn't need to stay in there. Oh, good uppercut from Tua. Tua 20 for the rest of the fight. Somebody's got uppercut. The high Tua combination at the end at the bell. It seemed like a Tua round. It's from it. 
But then he did nothing for the next 15 seconds. Alongside the Iceman, John Scully, I'm Joe Tessitore. Round 10. He has proven himself. Sixth when Ibuchi Jack didn't seem to have much of an Ibuchi back to it. Tua comes in with the left hooks, but backed off to reset himself. Good. Wow, and look at that. That's Snapping back the head of David Tua. He could bomb Tua with that if he really could Larry Holmes type around. Oh, here comes Tua. Four, five punches. And he, I right and he back gives at it him. back to him. That's right what he needs back to do. At him. He's so comfortable in that corner early on, even though Ibea Bucci was out working David Tua. Now, you really get the sense that there's a touch of desperation. Combination, the one or two big punches. So, Ibea Bucci should stay with the back to the jab. That's what they say. 11th round here in Sacramento. So if you apply yourself in preparing for him, getting the best shot, he's been able to return fire. And he's also strong. He's pushing to a back off of Here comes a little too late. Look at this exchange. Tua headhunting. He's Ike. not landing, though. Oh, oh good shot. It was Ibea Bucci who finishes it off with a left hook. David Tua, 27-0. The most hyped of the heavyweight prospects. Now, three minutes to determine it. But at the end of the 11th round, it was the left. Tua, lunging, looking for that left hook. Ibea Bucci, still punching in combinations. And Ike's staying right there with him. And Uppercut from Ike to the shoulder. There's the left hook, right hand combination. Throws five punches in that sequence. I pay a Bucci right back, but it's like they can't get their, their to a left hook. Every time he takes all the play away. Now they go swinging Big in the shot. middle of the ring. That's what they needed. Look at this. Nice way to end it. Very, very active heavyweight fight. Both men deserve credit. Ike really, really impressed. Who knew? 16 and 0. Ladies and gentlemen, after 12 rounds of boxing, we go to the scorecards. 117-111, 115-114, 116-113. In favor of the new WBC International Heavyweight Champion, Ike, the President, Ibea Bucci. Attention Ibea Bucci. heavyweight division, Ike Abea Bucci has arrived. Ike Ibiabuchi seems grateful for such a prestigious win and vows to come back in better than ever in hopes of a world title fight, but before announcing that he does his usual shtick, speaking in a low, ominous tone and weaving metaphors through his speech, explaining how he was destined to win the fight put in front of him. God, God first. In fact, I told you what has been hidden from the wise and the prudent have been revealed to the babes and the sufferings. I did not uh, come you to said, fight. Oh, no, you I'm finished, sir. I did not come to fight flesh and blood here, but spiritual wickedness in high and low places. As the night went on, it's revealed that Ike Ibabuchi went to the hospital later that night hearing voices and wanting to have his head checked for brain damage or a possible traumatic injury from the ring. Whilst nothing came up on the scans, that didn't stop a change in behavior that would begin to grow for the next few years of Ibiabuchi's life before his mind would continuously collapse in a horrible fashion. Ibiabuchi was praised for his incredibly strong performance against Tua, and the hype behind him was as big as ever. But 13 months after his victory against Tua, Ike would kidnap his ex-girlfriend's son and attempt suicide by crashing his car with the teenager inside. Whilst both survived, the 15-year-old would never be able to walk again. While some recognize the scariness within Ike, such as the World Boxing Council, who have gone on to mention how he once at dinner brandished a butcher knife and demanded belts from the WBC that he never won. No one believed him to do a crime so despicable for no apparent reason, but this was just the beginning. Ike served a short time in prison after such a heinous crime before returning to his normal life and taking up boxing again, and after two strong comeback fights, Ike would fight the undefeated Chris Bird, a future heavyweight champion of the world. The fight was even throughout, but in the fifth round, Ike showed the monster inside of him as he smashed Bird to the canvas twice and got the technical knockout. Just as things seemed to be promising again for the so-called or born Mike Tyson, another felony would be committed. 
After an unpleasant encounter in a casino with a female escort that resulted in Ibiabuchi barricading himself in a room and attempting to pepper spray police officers, Ike would find himself back in prison for many years to come. Fifteen years after being sent to prison, Ibiabuchi returned from jail a free man and demanded a return to the boxing world where he felt he belonged. But before the self-proclaimed presidents could find his seat in the sport again, he was once again sent to prison for giving no respect to his probation rules. He is now seemingly a free man again, but no one had heard from him since his supposed release from jail. So whilst both fighters seemingly had polar opposite careers when looking back in retrospect, it seems neither of them would have ended up on the paths they did if not for the show they had put on for the fans on that night back in 1997, in a fight that nowadays is often overshadowed for its surrounding consequences. Here at Boxing After Dark, we believe the fight itself is what should be celebrated and brought to light in a time when heavyweight boxing had some of its most peculiar yet engrossing attractions. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more from Boxing After Dark, Feel free to subscribe to the channel and don't be afraid to drop a like and comment. Thank you for watching.